Good evening, and welcome to One More Story Before Twelve, a true crime podcast that hopes to shed light on the events and cases left to linger in the darkness, those cases lost in the annals of time for reasons unknown, devoid of the notoriety encapsulated by their more media and public conscious relations. Crimes that have, over time, been left to gather dust on the shelves of history, The following tale hopes to cast some light on those bizarre, fascinating, cruel, yet always intriguing events that led to the stories I share with you now. Today's story is the first, to my knowledge, English language recollection of a long forgotten and obscure pre-World War II Polish criminal case. A case that, only recently, has been cast into the spotlight thanks to the book Serini Mordercy Drugi Rzeczpospolitej by Kamil Janicki. In it, Mr. Janicki shares the story of a man so despicable, so vile, so monstrous, that I was quick to find comparison with another infamous American case, that of notorious child slayer, rapist, and cannibal Albert Fish. I found, however, to my slight horror, The story of Poland's own Albert Fish somehow even more frightening, off-putting, and gruesome. The subject of today's examination is a man some have called the Vampire of Wuch or the Ghoul of Zgiesz, but to us he will be known as Ferdinand Gruning. What crimes did this man commit, and how is it that he has been forgotten almost entirely in today's times? Well then, I will tell you. I hope your drink is strong enough and you are bundled up warmly. Come closer to the fire. We have just enough time for one more story. One more story before twelve. Just to keep us warm. Our tale begins in Poland, specifically the city of Wuch and its neighboring towns and farms in 1938. Some brief historical context before we begin. After World War I, Poland regained its independence as the Second Polish Republic in 1918 and was slowly starting to thrive as a nation. It would be 21 years before the enroaching horrors of World War II would barge in through the borders and throw the country into a war zone turmoil, as well as political unrest for the next few decades following the war's conclusion. For now, though, Poland was entering what is now known as the Interbellum, a period of respite after more than a century of partitions by Austria-Hungary, the German, and the Russian empires. The Treaty of Versailles of June 1919 secured Poland's independence, while a series of border wars fought from 1918 to 1921 secured new territories and borders for the country, until these frontiers were settled in 1922 and internationally recognized in 1923. When Józef Piłsudski seized power in May of 1926, democratic policy ended and a more authoritarian, though not necessarily a dictatorship, form of rule was instituted, all while the country started achieving significant economic growth between the years 1921 and 1939. One of these thriving new metropolises was the city of Wuch, which housed many booming factories as the Industrial Revolution started swelling with fever pitch in Poland. It is here, and in the surrounding towns and farms, where our story starts. The 17th of October, 1938. As the sun was setting over the small farmstead of Kościuszkow, located just south of Kutno, A middle-aged man in well-worn and faded clothing entered the town through the dirt paths and made his way to the local Bergenmaster. Upon showing his identification, the Bergenmaster looked up and down and analyzed the small, seemingly frail figure before him. He looked destitute, unkept, yet there seemed to be an aura of calm around him. Per his documentation, It stated that his name was Ferdinand Gruning, age 53, a traveling sheet metal worker and repairman, this seemingly confirmed by the sheet metal shears he had in his wooden tool bag. 
He asked for a place to spend the night, and the kindly burgomaster agreed, allowing him to rest at a barn stationed in a homestead owned by a local farmer, Antoni Bembeniste. Just as he was filling out a form for the man's signature, in walked nine-year-old Vladislava Bagrovska with a pail of milk. She was supposed to return to her home with the dairy, which coincidentally lay past the farm of Antoni Bembeniste. The friendly and open young girl suggested she would leave the nice old gentleman to the farmstead, and a seemingly grateful Ferdinand rejoiced at the idea, praising the girl for her kindness to elders and offering her some candy from his pocket. The seemingly innocuous pair started conversing, and as they cleared a corner and disappeared from the burgomaster's sight, he had no idea that he would be the last person to see the girl alive. It was the loud banging on the burgomaster's door that startled him awake, a hammering and a seemingly frantic voice calling him from the other side. As he opened the door, a wide-eyed, shaken Stepan Pagrovsky, the father of Władysława, stood trembling. An elderly man who was father to six, upon his return home he noticed Vwaja, as he called her, absence, and was informed that she was last seen with a bum, heading off towards the direction of Bembenista's farm. Both men, fearful of what might have transpired, rushed off to Antoni's farmstead with an uncertain hope, fearing the old man and the girl were long gone by now, disappeared into the night. An awakened and groggy Bembenista opened the door to his house as he was called down by the men, and carefully explained that the elderly man they were looking for was indeed still in the barn, sleeping on some bales of hay. He noted that when he arrived he had bloodied hands, but he accepted his explanation that the man had simply cut himself on his shears, and he did present necessary documentation from the burgomaster after all. Upon entering the barn, the three men saw Ferdinand still asleep on the hay. Despite his protests, the three men forcefully woke him up and dragged him into the house, all the time asking where Bwaja was. A highly irritated Ferdinand retorted that it wasn't his job to look after strangers' kids, and that all he wanted was to sleep in peace. In horror, the men realized in the glow of the house's light that the man's clothes were stained with blood, as were his shears. Refusing to admit to any wrongdoing, the burgomaster summoned the police, and upon their arrival, they led Ferdinand to the station. There, in surprisingly quick fashion, without coercion or torture it seems, he confessed to murdering the girl. He said, I dragged the girl to a wheat field and stuck my scissors in her heart. A moment later she was dead, he proclaimed. However, it soon turned out that it wasn't all that he had done. Under police supervision, Ferdinand led them to the spot he had hastily buried the girl's body in, her little hand sticking out from the earth. Upon uncovering the child's body, it was discovered in horror that at least thirteen deep wounds were visible upon her body, her intestines and internal organs barely being contained in her damaged frame. It was later confirmed that after killing her, Gruning made his way to Bembenista's farm, and upon being notified that he could sleep in the barn, said he wanted to go back out to get something to eat. He returned to the spot he murdered the girl, and proceeded to sexually abuse and violate her corpse, removing her reproductive organs with his shears, and taking them back with him. The authorities had little doubt as to Gruning's involvement in the crime, per the stack of evidence that was quickly mounting up against him. It was also brought to light that a similar crime perpetrated on a child occurred in the area, barely 31 miles from the town in the past. However, truth would soon prove to be stranger than fiction, and the full extent of his heinous crimes had yet to be revealed. Ferdinand Gruning was born at the end of the 19th century in the city of Wuch, sometime in 1885, to a somewhat poor household of a factory worker. He was the second son of the family, possessing an older brother and four sisters, two of whom which died in their childhood. 
As Poland was occupied during this time, he went to a Russian school and spoke German in his household. At the time, he was seen as a bright and promising young boy who enjoyed learning. Matters, however, quickly took a turn for the worse, as seemingly with every year his temper would get increasingly more violent and hostile. He shunned friendships, preferring isolation, and if anything ever transpired not according to his desires, he would fly into a rage, gritting his teeth in a seething stupor. His mother would often defend him from the other children, demanding they be more accepting of his difficulties, as she called them, and allowed him to get away with the behaviors the other siblings wouldn't have even dreamed of doing. Around 1906, he was summoned from military duty, and his sisters breathed a sigh of relief, hoping they would find husbands and marry, leaving the household before his return. To their chagrin, he was discharged early, merely nine months after his service began. The cause, though never elaborated on, was stated as some form of degeneracy. The cause, though never elaborated, was stated as some form of degeneracy, excessive masturbation. The army was not noted for simply discharging soldiers at the time, preferring to break and remold the individual to their military needs. Whatever event transpired, truthfully, it must have been serious enough to make the army get rid of him entirely and let the family deal with the fallout. After his return home, his behavior worsened. His foul temper somehow degraded even further, and he didn't stay long at any job, drinking heavily and profusely deep into the hours of the night. His brother August, five years his senior, stated that he became a violent, sadistic man who drank heavily. I feared him and did my best to cut off all ties and any contact with him. The rest of Ferdinand's siblings behaved similarly, as he was not only a violent and cruel, ill-tempered man, but he had a tendency to commit brutal rapes. He would often attempt, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, to force himself on various women, either young or elderly, age making little difference to him. After a while, he seemed to concentrate his efforts exclusively on younger girls, especially children. In 1914, he raped a six-year-old called Yezerska and was sentenced to prison. However, the eruption of World War I ended his incarceration early, and he was free to return to his home serving very little of his planned time behind bars. The parents, in a dazed and frightened manner, realized something must be done, and hoped that by arranging a marriage they could put a stop to his seemingly endless cruelty and rapes. Those hoping that this marriage would soothe the beast were soon proven otherwise, as Ferdinand proceeded to sell his wedding ring and wedding clothes the day after the ceremony for vodka and other alcohol. When he was arrested and sentenced to a year in prison for theft, his wife fled from him, eager to escape the horror she had walked into. However, upon his release, he somehow convinced her to return to him, proclaiming he was a changed man. For a year, the reunited couple lived together and a baby girl was soon born into the world. The child didn't live long, however, and sadly passed away after only a couple of months. The circumstances of the child's death are unknown and somewhat unclear. What is known is that Ferdinand decided he had enough of his wife and ventured out into the open world. The two never reunited again. On July 28, 1926, a horrific crime transpired in a small village called Zhuki, located a mile away from Turku, a small town situated 50 miles west of Wuch. Seven-year-old Irenka Ernt, or Ernest, the newspapers aren't clear to the name, often given various descriptions or spellings of it, was asked to accompany a 40-year-old man who occasionally did menial jobs for her parents to the local blacksmith. This man was Ferdinand Gruning, and at the time he was a vagabond, 
and a traveling sheet metal worker, doing whatever local jobs he could do to survive, and living in a desolate shanty shack just nearby. Please let her accompany me. I'm so fond of this girl. The parents thought nothing of it, as Ferdinand appeared to be a relatively calm and gentle man, and they seemed at ease, as they had known him for some time by that point. As the pair left Turku and neared the village of Zhuki, Gruning dragged the girl into the nearby woods and proceeded to rape and viciously murder her. Afterwards, he returned to his family in Wuch for a night's rest, where he was promptly arrested and charged with murder. The court issued a strict sentence, life in prison, and he was transported to Ravich Penitentiary to begin his lifelong term. Two days after passing sentence, Ferdinand's mother passed away. Some say from shock, others say from a broken heart that her son had committed so vile an act. His father, widowed and ashamed, had left Poland to find work in Germany, and only his two sisters now comfortably married and counting their blessings that they had a different surname, and brother remained. In a shocking turn of events, new prison reform laws were implemented in Poland at the time, and only a year into his sentence, Gruning was given a shocking clemency of amnesty. The courts argued that his killing wasn't motivated by money, greed, or criminal enterprise, and was merely a crime of passion. As such, he shouldn't be treated too strictly by the courts. His lifelong sentence was commuted to ten years. Ferdinand also applied to work as a prison stoker, like his father before him, and soon experienced eye problems due to the strenuous work, which eventually resulted in semi-blindness in both eyes. The prison doctor who examined him stated that a two-month period of recovery was needed, and he was given a temporary parole to rest his eyes. And so, in the spring of 1934, Gruning was let out back into the world, serving barely eight years of his already shortened ten-year sentence. With only his word that he would return after his parole was up, he ventured out back into the world and returned to Wuch, where he stayed with one of his sisters, who was less than thrilled about her brother's return. On May 30th, he passed through the town of Zgiesz, located just seven miles north of Wuch, through one of his many wandering walks, when he spotted a group of boys playing soccer. He asked the boys if one of them would be so kind as to walk him back to the tram, a service for which he was offering to pay up to 50 groshe. One of the boys, named Tadeusz Kuczynski, studied the self-proclaimed sheet metal worker and his giant wooden toolbox and rejected the offer. Another boy, 11-year-old Józef Hudobinski, agreed to help walk the old man to his destination, enticed by the financial compensation. It was the last time the boy was seen alive. His worried parents attempted to sway the disinterested police to search for their boy. The authorities, however, were convinced the boy simply ran away from home and would return the moment the fair weather turned foul. Undeterred by this, the parents launched their own campaign, sending out flyers and letters to local newspapers asking if anyone had seen their boy, trying to stir up as much interest from the local populace. To no avail, as no report or confirmation ever crossed their way for the longest time. Eventually, on July 18, 1934, a local farmer, Stefan Krupinski, at the nearby situated village of Piaskovica, telephoned police with a shaken voice. During his work in his wheat field, he stumbled across the poorly concealed body of a young boy, his head severed from his body, all in a state of severe decay and mutilation. Pieces of the body were either eaten by local wildlife or began decomposing away, and it was only the name of the boy inside his hat found nearby that led police to positively identify him as Yusuf Hudobinsky. An investigation was launched, and the newspapers triumphantly announced in a short time the success of the police, as they apprehended 34-year-old Julian Suazen, who was suspected of committing the crime. 
In due time, however, the embarrassed police let him go, as it turns out they completely missed their mark, and the newspapers didn't even bother running a corrected story of events. No other suspect was apprehended or charged by police. How could they, as Ferdinand Gruning returned to prison, just as his parole ended? In time, his sentence was finished, and his debt to society seemingly paid, Gruning was once again unleashed upon the world in the cusp of 1936-1937. Little is known of exactly where he spent his time during these months, or what areas he patrolled and visited. One thing is known for sure. He was in Piotrkov on July 8, 1938. On that day, he encountered an eight-year-old girl called Lutsina Gore. Leading her into some rye field, he asked her to remove her underwear. When the girl refused, Gruning struck her neck with his shears, violently threw her to the ground, and proceeded to sexually assault the girl. Shockingly, the girl survived the attack and was discovered by a passerby who quickly alerted police to his disturbing find. During the testimony, the girl didn't remember much and offered up to eight variations of the event often leading police down confusing trails. It's uncertain if she didn't remember, or if she was simply too scared or embarrassed to admit what had transpired. She was only able to give a vague, fuzzy description of her assailant. Kruning had once again escaped capture, and wouldn't be until his murder of Waja that his monstrous deeds would be put to an end. Seemingly. Let us now return back to that police station, where Ferdinand Gruning is currently being questioned by police as to why he perpetrated such crimes. When asked and probed, he calmly replied to them, I simply felt a need. I felt a need to murder a girl. He claimed he felt the highest of pleasures when he removed her reproductive organs in a calm, cool, collected tone. It became rapidly clear that, although he was no Napoleon of crime, Gruning was nonetheless a cold, calculating, and vicious killer who had committed numerous atrocities, and would continue to do so had he not been stopped. The public prosecutor, Yulian Machayevsky, was enlisted to deal with the Gruning case, despite being a complete novice in such matters, and was considered by many to be way over his head in dealing with such an individual. Surprisingly, despite coming clean and admitting to all his crimes related to Vwaja, Gruning strangely decided to deny any further involvement in any crimes, outright lying about his incarceration as merely being for petty theft instead of murder, and that he remained free during the crimes he was questioned for, despite obviously being in prison during some of them, committing them during his parole. He stubbornly refused to answer any further inquiries, either remaining silent or completely relegating them as lies or denying them. During the investigation, the boys who witnessed the last moments of Yusuf were brought in, and despite four years having passed, they were all able to recognize and identify Gruning as the man who murdered their friend. Further inquiries finally led to Ferdinand admitting his involvement in Yusuf's murder, as well as, in his mind, the murder of Lutzina, who unbeknownst to Gruning, survived his attack. The press had a field day with Ferdinand, labeling him a vampire who loved to drink the blood of his victims and eat parts of their bodies, though this cannibalism aspect was never properly explored and examined, it remained a pivotal moment of his Lustmord crimes, as they were called. As such, his full list of crimes were as follows. 1. The rape of six-year-old Yezierska in 1914. 2. The rape and murder of seven-year-old Irena Ernst in 1926. 3. The murder of Yusuf Hudobinsky in 1934. 4. The rape and attempted murder of Lutsina Gore in 1938. 5. The rape and murder of Waja Pargovska in 1938. After stating all these, Gruning said he had committed no more crimes. This, however, didn't satisfy the prosecution, and an inquiry into further murders and crimes was launched. At one point, the list of possible murders perpetrated 
was rumored to be as high as 20, although no concrete evidence was ever found tying Gruning to these crimes or individuals, and they eventually had to be dropped, despite a sensationalized press trying to pin every child murder in the last 20 years on Gruning. This is not to say that more crimes weren't committed, but simply due to the lack of evidence or facts, we will be sticking with these five. When examined by doctors, despite his sexual abnormalities, he was deemed sane and fit to stand trial, and he did so on February 28, 1939, at the Wuj Courthouse. The prosecutor was, of course, Yulian Maciejewski, and the defense counsel of Gruning was, was Wanda Czechot. During the trial, Gruning was mostly silent, replying in non-answers or saying, they say I did, to every question. He would sometimes lead the court in a merry-go-round game of repeating his name over and over, instilling a farce and a nonsensical version that he was apparently not deemed fit to stand trial and that he was insane. The matter of his cannibalism was discussed, but it was unknown if a verdict was ever reached regarding the matter, due to the case being labeled as secret in some parts. In fact, many aspects of the trial were labeled as such, and more drastic scenes, as well as closing arguments and statements, were never made public. The matter closed up relatively quickly, and the court found Ferdinand Gruning guilty of all crimes and sentenced him to a triple death penalty by hanging. Unfazed, he accepted the verdict, knowing that plenty of appeals would be possible, postponing his date with death as long as he was able to muster. And such appeals were numerous, as was his right by Polish law. The last recorded one was in August of 1939, where Gruning was to be moved to Tworek prison, with a further inquiry to be made in September 13th, 1939. That date, however, never materialized. World War II erupted in Poland in 1939 on September 1st, and numerous prisons were liberated by the Russians and the Germans, simply forced open at times, spilling out all their prisoners into a soon-to-be war-ravaged country. Ferdinand Gruning was one of those men, and it is unknown what became of him, or indeed, if any kind of justice or retri or indeed, if any kind of justice or retribution was ever served towards him. No mention, record, or trace of him, either alive or dead, exists after this date. Thus ends the story of the Beast of Wuj, the Ghoul of Zgiesh, Ferdinand de Gruning. I noticed a lot of parallels with Albert Fish in this case, predominantly the swaying of children, tempting them with candy, offering them to lead him to areas or take him on walks, as well as their vicious murders, rapes, and removing parts of their body to satisfy his needs. The more horrifying aspect is that while Fish eventually paid for his crimes at the electric chair in January of 1936, it is unknown if Gruning ever did, and for all accounts and possibilities, he may very well have escaped and never been caught. Before I depart, I have two individuals to thank profusely for assisting with this episode. First is Marcin Mishka from the channel Criminatorium, who generously supplied pages and excerpts from the book Serini Mordercy Drugi Rzeczpospolitej. As shipping to the States from Poland is a little difficult now, I, I obtained a prior look into this case thanks to him, before obtaining and ordering my own copy of the book. It's a fascinating read, and who knows, I might cover another topic from it soon one of these days. I also have to thank the channel Zbrodnie Zapomniane for pointing me in the right direction and obtaining press material from the time in order to flesh out my episode. Without your savvy, I wouldn't have been able to add the necessary details to flesh out this recollection. I do highly recommend checking out their respective content, even if it is for Polish-speaking audiences only, 
they divulge some fascinating true crime stories, events, and people for the eager listener. I provided links to their channels in the description down below. I also thank you, the listener, for staying so patiently and listening to this tale. You are quite brave, and who knows what future stories I'll regale you with soon. Well, the coals are finally dying out. Shall we end our meeting for now? Until next time, I wait to see you all by the fire for another story. One more story before twelve.